All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So today we're going to talk about a problem that we're calling multi-build. Um, this is probably, if anybody's an MCU boot developer, this is distinct from the multi-image that MCU boot is talking about. So those are, maybe this is not the droids you're looking for, but all right. So uh, we're going to do a little disclaimer, talk about what the problem is, and talk about one approach uh, which has been put into the PR that you can see up there, 13672. And then I want to try to get to discussion as quick as I can. Um, though I don't know how much time we're going to have. I'm going to make, this is something that we've been discussing within Zephyr for quite some time. And so I'm assuming that there's kind of going to be a huge level of difference of uh, experience with this problem in the room from what is this problem to like, we were just arguing about it for the past couple hours right over there. Um, and I'll do my best to assume as little as possible um, and then hand it off. So the disclaimer is that Nordic has, uh, has a dog in this fight. We have a very particular solution which we're running in our downstream. We've been running it for quite some time. It does work. Um, however, I am trying, this is an upstream focused presentation and I'm trying to be kind of an impartial dis describer of what's going on. But, you know, everybody knows who pays my bills. So that's out there. Uh, what's the problem? Okay. There are an increasing number of use cases that we've been running into uh, throughout the community, really. This is not just restricted to my company, uh, where we want to build multiple Zephyr binaries that are all interdependent in some sense. Uh, and the sense can be very different depending on the use case, but they are all sort of targeting one SOC. Um, and the way that we can do this now is that we can create a separate build system for every one of these binaries and then do whatever, however, you know, tools we choose to validate the interdependencies between them or, you know, pass dependencies between them and then get them running on our boards, right? So there are some problems with this, which uh, I will go into, and we have a proposed solution for this, but, you know, that's what we're here to discuss. Okay. So the first of these is, is usability. Um, and what you can see listed is that, you know, you've got multiple build and flash steps, but it's a little bit more uh, difficult than that, right? There are certain cases like how much space am I allocating to my bootloader and how much is left over to the application where it would be really nice uh, to do it in a more integrated way where if I increase the amount of space allocated to my bootloader, the amount of space allocated to the application is decreased by the same amount. Um, or in other contexts, you know, like in a trusted firmware image, you have a partition between the peripherals between your secure and your non-secure world. So if I use the spy in my secure world, I cannot use it in the non-secure world. And it would be great if we can produce kind of a single system that knows that and can check it for the user. So, it, you know, it's not just that there's more steps, it's also that uh, interdependency leaves more work in the hands of the application developer unless we have kind of more framework level support for this somewhere in Zephyr. Uh, there are some performance concerns. Uh, and the main issue is that, you know, a, a build DAG has these sort of serialized steps at the beginning and the end. And then in between it's, you know, using all your cores to build the individual C files. But, you know, while it's doing linking, that's very inherently serial. While it's generating header files for autoconf.h, for example, you can't really build any C files until that's done. Uh, so there are some steps that, um, if you're doing each of these binary, if you're eva evaluating the DAGs for these build systems separately, then you're leaving some, you know, performance on the table, especially at the beginning and the end. Um, and then if you're doing them in parallel, like, you know, you're allocating some threads to one application binary and another set of threads to another, uh, well, that limits you from doing some cross-checking in some ways, but it also is kind of unclear about how, how to map threads to builds, right? Um, you're also doing some repeated configure time work. Um, but then the main thing is kind of what we already started getting into is the dependency management, right? So everybody's got, you know, if everybody's got their own application build directory, so you can't share memory between, like, say, a minion core, right? So if you've got uh, a single SOC where you've got a Bluetooth controller on it uh, that's a separate core than the application core, um, you're going to need probably some shared memory area to, to swap your buffers around, right? And it would be nice to be able to say in one place and have a single point of truth, where are the boundaries of this memory area, right? Um, there's another case that comes up with, with Trust Zone, which is just not just like the partitions of the peripherals, it's also that you're going to have um, kind of a system call interface between the non-secure world and the secure world, right? So the way that that's going to work is that the secure build is going to generate a dot A that the build system for the insecure world must link in, 
right? So it's going to give you some function signatures and give you this .a that you can link into your insecure image that lets you call into the secure world, right? And so if you're going to do this with multiple build directories, you have to somehow, you know, let the other one know as an input, here's my previous output archive. Um, and then, you know, there's this issue which we've already talked about, like enforcing compatibility, which comes up in the bootloader use case, for example. Um, okay, I wanted to talk about example use cases before going on, hit my backup slides, because this is something that we, uh, we had a question about an hour ago. Um, so bootloader chains are one, so MCU boot is a Zephyr application, uh, and it's gonna boot the main Zephyr application. Uh, it needs to know where it is. <laughs> it needs to know how to upgrade it, all this other stuff. Uh, longer chains of the same thing, you know, so uh, we have multiple stage boot, right? So it's not just a two stage boot. Um, the minion cores we've already talked about. Uh, another thing you might think about would, uh, in terms of minion cores, which are kind of very the inherently AMP SOCs where you've got like, it's not just like an SMP core, right? Everybody here understands that. Um, Another one you might run into is that there could be like a really fast, sleepy application core um, that wants to offload a little bit of work to a, a lower power core that might be, you know, kind of directly pulling on a sensor or something like that. And the application core, for power management reasons, wants to go back to bed as soon as it can. Um, and then trust zone we've kind of already talked about. So these are kind of the main use cases that we think that uh, we'd like to try to address, at least at first. And so this is where we're sort of restricting our discussion to because this is a very broad problem space. So I'm going to rewind. All right. Now, those of you who are familiar with CMake uh, may say, great, it has this external project feature. Uh, why don't we just use that? Uh, and there is a, a, an open AMP sample in Upstream's effort, which does. Uh, there is a problem with it, which is that um, the dependencies between the two builds are not propagated between them. So if I have, you know, an application, you know, kind of the main application, and then I've got my, like, little open AMP minion core over here, uh, what's going to happen is that if you update a file which both of those applications rely on, like say some file in the kernel, and then build the top level build system again, it doesn't know about the dependencies down here. And so it doesn't rebuild them. Um, so it, it's not, it doesn't really work properly, right? It's not, a, it's not, at least as far as we can tell, a good solution out of the box for this problem. Because we want to manage these dependencies. And Sebastian says no. He knows way more about CMake than I ever will. It's just it, it's working as designed, basically. Uh, unknown, yeah. But it doesn't work the way we want, is the, the TLDR on that. So this is kind of the approach that we've got right now, and I'm just going to do a quick time check because I do want to try to leave some room for discussion, although I expect that we're going to be talking about this all week. Um, okay. So um, CMake has this feature called add subdirectory, right? And you can say, pull, you know, execute the script files in this subdirectory and include them in my current build system. So right now, uh, what we have is a way to basically call add subdirectory on the top level application directory of another Zephyr application, right? So you've got one application uh, which has a top level CMake list, right? And it's gonna, via, uh, you know, the mechanisms that you're probably familiar with if you're a Zephyr developer, call into the main Zephyr build system, right? And then that's gonna add subdirectory in all the kernel drivers, all the other subsystems. Um, one of the new things that you can do though is say, uh, I'm building all of this for my main image, my app image, right? But you can also say, I want you to add a new Zephyr image, right? And what that's gonna do is it's gonna clear out a lot of the global variable namespace that we kind of rely on within Zephyr. So for example, uh, all our kconfig variables uh, that are the result of merging our kconfig fragments become global CMake variables in the Zephyr build system. And we use that throughout to say, add this C file to the build if def config feature. Right? And so that obviously won't work uh, with, if we're trying to put all of this into one big CMake build system, which is what we're trying to do. So we have this new magic thing called image. And whenever you switch images, you can then call add subdirectory uh, on your new application uh, top level CMake list. And it's going to add it and you know, reset all your, kick, all your config foos and, and do a bunch of other stuff. 
Um, now, there, there are some drawbacks to this because not everything in CMake can be namespaced. Uh, it has kind of this long legacy of backwards compatibility, and that introduces some constraints into what you can namespace. Uh, in particular, there is a global target namespace. So I cannot call something, you know, drivers, USB, whatever, vendor, uh, and you know, have that be the top level target to build that library for some particular application and then reuse that target name for another application that may want to configure USB differently, right? So that's a problem. Um, and what we have chosen to do is uh, prefix the names of targets with the name of the image that we're currently building. Uh, and the same thing is true for certain global variables. Uh, the cache, right, there are certain, you know, CMake namespaces that we are prefixing with the name of the image, right? So this is not a small change. This is a pretty big change that affects many, many files throughout the build system. Um, one thing that we're trying to do with this PR since the first time that it was uh, proposed upstream is that we've moved as many global variables as we could into target properties of this new target that we indirect through a variable. And so that's what's that Zephyr thing on the next to last second level bullet. So there's this variable called Zephyr target, and it expands to image Zephyr, right? And so you say, I want you to set a property on the current Zephyr target. And you, as the author of like a driver level CMake file, don't need to know like which image am I building for. It's just like this is some sort of property that's global to the image. And so by moving as many things over to uh, properties, we're trying to decrease the scope of this, but there are certain things like, for example, targets that we just can't change because it's a CMake thing. So that's, that's kind of a 20 second overview of what we have proposed. Um, and I didn't, you know, I didn't write the CMake parts of this. All I did was kind of make it work with West and, and tweak it a little bit. Uh, so I'm looking at this as independently as I can and I'm trying to make lists of pros and cons that I think there is broad consensus on. And of course, again, this is highly asterisks. If you disagree that there's consensus on anything in this list, like yell at me and I will, I will be wrong. Um, so one of the pros is that this exists and it works. Uh, we've shipped this downstream. It has been part of official releases. It works with Segger Embedded Studio, which is the IDE that we use. So, you know, one major advantage is that within a single CMake build system, which you can point an IDE at because IDEs understand CMake, you can get an overview of your entire build. Uh, it is, you know, easy to use from the perspective of building and flashing, right? Because you can use the same tools, you know, if you're using raw CMake and Ninja or if you're using uh, West Build and Flash, you do it once and it builds all of the applications and knows how to flash them all together. Uh, it does solve the performance problems, right? It's one big build system. That means there's only one job server. And so when, since the dependencies are tracked properly, you know, different linker steps can be performed in parallel. Um, the fine-grained target and dependency sharing and configure time work is only done once, kind of by definition, because there's only one build system, right? That's what CMake does. That's its purpose. So there are some cons. Um, one is that in its current form, it doesn't allow multiple tool chains. So if you're, you know, targeting two different, uh, Architectures, for example, that's an issue. We have done some early prototyping, which is at least convince us internally that this can be overcome with another layer of indirection like every, every problem, right? So you point your, your tool chain at a script that then knows some image specific context for what tool chain to call out to. So that's solvable. Uh, the other two are that it is complex and that it won't go away, right? So you need to know, you know, you will need to know about this if you develop at least driver or kernel level Zephyr code. Um, and that will cost some maintenance because, you know, you might forget to put the image there or you might use the old target name without the image prefix and then it's going to work when you're only building one application but subtly break in case you want to build that same application as a sub image, right? Uh, there are some differences of opinion where people believe that certain things are, are pros and true and other people do not believe that those things are true at all uh, and likewise for cons. Uh, there, you know, some people think that a non-recursive build just like is the best practice and we should always do it. Uh, I think the main opposition to that is like not if it's too complicated or intrusive. Um, and there seems to be a different perspective on that. Um, 
Yeah, you can kind of read it. Uh, peop, you know, people sort of feel like on the on the on the left. Yeah, we're both looking at the same thing on the left. You know, that it's kind of it's worth it, right? Is I, I guess how I would try to sum it up. That like, given that this works, given that it exists, given that it's been deployed for a long time uh, in production, the fact that it introduces these complexity costs is worth it. Uh, and then I think on the other side, people are saying, no, we should do this elsewhere. Like doing this in CMake is not the right place to be doing this. Um, and again, this is just like my read on the discussion. Um, and, and please, during the discussion, uh, tell, me, tell me what I got wrong. Uh, okay, so let's get to it. I do have some ideas, but I do kind of just want to let people talk. Uh, I will skip to the last one, which is, you know, obviously, Trying to guess what your users are doing is, is very hard, and it's been really nice actually to have Bricks here kind of telling us as a user how he feels about it. And I would really encourage any Zephyr users that haven't had a chance to, to give their opinion uh, to please, please do so, um, so that you know, we're not just guessing. Um, but yeah, so what's, is, is this really better? Is this, you know, does, do we want to keep the same way? Is recursive CMake a viable alternative? Do we? disagree entirely vehemently enough that we're never going to be able to upstream this. Some, some ideas for discussion, but otherwise, uh, if anybody wants the mic or we can just talk. Now you're shy. Okay. That's fun. <laughs> anybody have any questions? Uh, is this thing on? Test, test. Okay, that sounds like it's working, right? So I don't know how recursive versus non-recursive differs between CMake and Make. You know, there's the famous paper, Recursive Make Considered Harmful, and it talks about a lot of problems with doing recursive makes, mostly about dependencies not having anything to do between the invocations and your builds don't work. And it, it seems like you've got that same notion here of that stuff that's shared between these would not be shared. Um, I guess the question is what are the, I didn't see like spelling out, this is the recurs first I've seen on the slides of a recursive make as an alternative. Are you talking about just like a top level CMake file that just invokes it CMake several times kind of thing, or separate build directories with scripts, that kind of thing? I mean, at one level, you could always have, I mean, think of how like Yocto does something like this where, you know, we invoke CMake and do it once this way and then we invoke it and do it this way. And there's some external tool that then combines all of this together and just builds it. And I, I don't know if I have enough opinions about what's better or not on that. I don't think, I don't know if I have a question. The, so. The core of the pro problem. so the core of the problem of the recursive make being harmful is that um, uh, build systems work by having a graph tracking all dependencies. Um, but uh, if you uh, don't have one graph but uh, several, then and there actually do exist dependencies uh, between the graphs, uh, then uh, the, 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 the solutions for pretending like you have one graph, they don't scale very well. And yeah, we're not really sure how to... Yeah, I can't comment specifically about the... Yeah, I, th I think I re read, like I ported the Linux kernel's uh, build system, kbuild, um, from uh, Zephyr, or Zephyr used to use like nearly a one-to-one -one, uh, copy of the Linux kernel's build system, and I ported that to uh, CMake, together with uh, Anas and several people. And uh, in, in that uh, top of the, Cable build system, it had like this comment about because we do recursive make, you have to be very careful about uh, the order that you include uh, sub uh, modules in the Linux kernel. So I'm not sure I agree that it works fine in the Linux kernel, but yeah. I guess someone else will have to comment on that. Yeah. 
yeah, it's uh, even worse, I would say, then. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we are not trying to... And it's not quite one image, because they're, I mean, they're using it to build, like, a boot thing, which they used to. They don't do that anymore, but... But, but it's not trying to solve, so, for example, like if you had... So, so Xilinx SOC, where they've got a microblade and a Cortex-A, right? right? The kernel build system is not trying to build the two kernels for that in a single location. Right? Your, right. your expectation is you build those as two different, right? They're, even if it's a build system, they're not. Right. The assumption is that that's two separate builds. And so I, the recursive versus not, I kind of question a little bit here because we're really talking about different software entity, right? So it's it, it would be like to say, I'm going to non-recursively build my whole distro, right? right? And that's you know, I mean, that's obviously very excessive, but, but, <laughs> right, but, but it's kind of in the sense that my, you know, my U-boot versus my kernel, I'm not building in the same building location, right? Um, well, so what is the complexity of these dependencies that we have to do? We, we have partition layout, we have, what else do we have? We have peripherals, we have... Uh, peripherals, like peripheral configuration? Uh, the, the owner of the peripheral. Okay, yeah. Uh, there's the... the we should show people. Yeah. Is this stuff that, like, is in the device tree? This is something Erwan was bringing up. So. Yeah. Uh, the question was, is this in device tree? And it's like, yes and no, right? Like, no, mean, right now there's no the global view. Well, the thing is, and also why is it in the device tree? Is it in the device tree? Yeah, because they, 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 they never execute concurrently, right? They, they yes. execute sure, and then boot and never come back. So. It may need a spy flash for a right. kernel otherwise. And that's fine if it needs it, but I'm saying that they're, they're the presumption, so there's some different things, right? So it becomes, there are two different aspects of peripherals here, right? There's, there's something like a UART where you're handing it over, right? So you used it, and now what's the state of it? We've talked, you know, this has come up, right? And so what... The next guy gets it. Is it in the reset state, or is it in some right. state that I need to know? Which is another conversation we should probably have at some Right. Time. Versus, hey, this is a peripheral, and you didn't touch it because you weren't supposed to, so I can assume it's in the reset state when I get to the application. So that. So yeah, while there is a temporal notion that every time you do web search or that's something else, and it's no longer there, there is still needing to know what the peripheral kind of. But it's hard to. doesn't deal with, and I kind of wonder how much value is there in this specific use case versus and having the complexity to support all of this when you can't deal with all the other use cases where yep. I've got, you know, the example I gave earlier, like a Cortex-A and a Cortex-M on the same SOC, and I... Yeah, yeah. yeah. This, this is exactly the same thing, that I maybe shed some light more from the outside, 
because we are doing IVI systems, and uh, there we have really complex SOCs with uh, big cores where Linux is running on, and there's a secure world, and uh, there are some tiny cores that are running on the same SOC in Artos, not Zephyr in this case, but anyway. Um, but the problem is the same. You have to share peripherals, you have to share your flash, your device tree must be correct, and... and we don't No, absolutely not. I mean, it, you have different artists that have completely different build systems. And, uh, but it, in the end, you still have the problem that you have to share some common configuration between the different parts. It yeah. may be the flash layout, it may be the memory map, uh, which also boils down to the, uh, to the device tree of the kernel. And I guess a challenge, can we think of something It is. I mean, we also have the, the problem. Of this, yes. Have yeah, you yeah. Have, we also have shared headers. Yeah, yeah we, have, we, have also, we have. We have also APIs between the different cores. Uh, yeah. You know, and they need to have to share some some header files, some common definitions, what the API calls are. Yeah. Uh, but this this one is actually simple. But for example, we have some uh, um, some parts in the system that uh, do the CAN communication with the car, and they have some very specific APIs that are exposed to Linux, and this is some kind of RPC calls, and they have to share some common I IDL in the end. So we have parts of the system that share really common source code, and I think your problem is just one. One, one part of it, so, uh, but there's a bigger scope uh, at work here. And the way how we solved it by our own tool, so we, we created a MetaBell tool uh, to drive all these builds. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, and it is, uh, the way how it does it is you, you really, uh, uh, you, you, you get all your tool chains configured by that, and you put out the dependencies between those, and then you let the tool build the different images in parallel, and then stitch them together to bigger images, and in the end you have some big flash image that you put onto your no flash. The challenge with doing them in parallel is when you have things generated by one build needed by the next one. Yeah, you have to really separate these parts together and hand over the build results from, from one, I, I would call, package to another one. But you... In parallel, probably it's a little bit extreme. You're not mm. building them at the same time. You are in sequentially, probably, and so it's you can hand over information. But yeah, yeah, but it's... Not yeah, yeah, but it's a big graph. You have all different entities from the free Artos, which is running on one core, uh, up to the BusyBox package, uh, the Linux kernel, they are all different packages and they have dependencies between each other. Uh, so the libc needs the kernel headers and so on. And uh, then you this let... This is the Yocto <laughs> case, basically. Yeah. Uh, yes, Yocto. Uh, yeah. So we don't use Yocto anymore. Yeah. Uh, we just replace it also with the same yeah. tool. And... Uh, No, no, I, no. I mean, I, I don't want to go but there. What, what about <laughs> something like, uh, what is their build tool called? Bulky. Big 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 Big, yeah. Yeah, yeah, something like Big Big. So. West. <laughs> West yeah. Big. Right, no, West I'm Big. thinking <laughs> more specifically, actually Big Big, not something just like it. Mm, yeah, but Big Big is... Big is known to be very slow, used to be very slow, actually. Yeah, but Big Big doesn't really cope with the multi-tool chain very good. Right, I'm just wondering. The fear I have is like, oh, look, we have this neat problem. Only been solved several dozen times. Let's solve it again. Yeah. I'm, yeah, not yeah. I'm not sure if this one is really solved. I mean, are we making a distribution? Is that what's going on? Yeah, this, but this is not, this a, is not a distribution. Yeah. Yeah. I think well. it's, it's not adding much code. It's just making the existing code a lot uh, re entrant, like that right. it can be run. But the question yeah, is, how many problems? We're not adding solving. a huge system that you have to learn. It's just a few rules about 
Right. Uh, but we're only solving a tiny piece yeah, of the problem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What about other things, the, the two processors that are different and that part yeah. of one of the images isn't, isn't actually running Zephyr? Yeah. yeah. But, so but so this is a particular problem that can be solved relatively easily and expensively. You know, this is a subjective appreciation, of course, and, uh, uh, and in a, an optimized manner with the current CMake build system. The others are harder to, s to solve uh, like that. Uh, Especially right. the combining but, millennials. But you know, if some, if so, okay, so I mean, we can say, okay, let's do that this way, but other use cases, let's solve them using some meta tool. But then we go, the meta tool would actually address this problem as well. So no, because the meta tool would know about this functionality, so in so which function? part, well, the one that this particular PR offers, so that means that if, if the meta tool needs to know that you need to build two separate images from the same code base, it could use this functionality to build those. benefit from this, knowing that, yes, that the yes, functionality yes. is baked into the... But then the you have a meta tool to build the meta thing, and <laughs> this is this is already getting... Yeah, no, I mean, no, I would... I actually disagree. <laughs> it's, uh, it's... I mean, the, I, I, the, this this solves that particular problem. Multiple mm -hmm. Zephyr images from a common code base. That's that it solves this one. Now, if, you, if your use case includes also stitching with uh, pre-built uh, binaries, if it, if it includes combining with Linux, all of that, you need a layer bulb. But that particular problem is solved by this, and it's solved in an efficient manner. Now, you can argue that the complexity added to the build path is not worth it. So that we might as well fix, uh, uh, support all the use cases with a meta tool instead. That's a fair, a fair you know, we, we can discuss that. But w what I'm trying to get here is that this, this, uh, this change does not try to solve all of these problems. Yeah. So, and it's arguably... And then you can scale it up to support right. Linux sure. and others. Yeah. Sure, but then, but, then, but then you wouldn't be solving it the same way with the same efficiency. So it's Maybe not the same so How much is efficiency, actually? Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 You're yeah. right. So I am what efficiency, percentage but of I, efficiency? I that was exactly my question, Paul. Yeah. consistency across the, whatever the software may be, which I think is more beneficial. Because I think that the spectrum of the number of cases of Zephyr plus Zephyr plus Zephyr is smaller than Is there anybody that has an example of how much worse the new code looks versus the old? It's, in a, it's in a pull request, so you can, okay. you can look just at the pull look request. at the, at the uh, I think the number was up on the slides. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just search for non-recursive. Yeah, if you search for non-recursive yeah. on the GitHub, you will so see. My gut feeling from what you just said is I would describe it.
that's the pull request for the person who was asking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You got it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. All right, I think we're about actually out of time. Um, I started my timer a minute late. Um, let's keep discussing, but for now, I guess we should we should let the good folks who are in the back of the room running running the uh, the room have their time back. Thanks a lot. Thank you.